Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have a confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Grant. <clears throat> well, as we come to this text this morning, as you know, we've been in the book of Hebrews, but as we come to this text, it's helpful to know we're making a transition in the book of Hebrews. So up until this point, there has been a lot of doctrinal truth that we have learned about Christ. And now the author of Hebrews is kind of making a turn to share how we should live. So in light of what we have learned, how then shall we live? The things that we have learned thus far should make a difference in how we live today. There's a reason that in this book, the first 10 and a half chapters are rehearsing, going over truths about Christ and what Christ has done and what he's accomplished and how he is a greater priest than Melchizedek and so many things that we've learned. And then the last few chapters are about application because we want the accent to be on Christ. It's important for us to, to do, to go and to take action, but what we don't wanna do is we don't wanna start to make new regulations or rules to follow because that's what the author of Hebrews was warning the Hebrew Christians against. He was warning them against following the old regulations. But yet it's important for us to respond. It's important for us to have the truth about Christ affect the way that we live, and we want to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. So this morning, as Wes already said, things are going to look a little differently because we might pause. We're going to pause to take action for the things that we are learning so that when we leave this place, we have the rhythm of taking action on the truths that we are overwhelmed with, with who Christ is. So before we do that, I'm, I'm just gonna pray again because I feel the need for God to meet us this morning. Father, I ask that you would come this morning and meet us. May we sit under your word. May we be amazed at our glorious Savior afresh this morning. Father, continue the work that you have begun in us. Start a work with some who've not yet trusted Christ, but then continue that work that we would be changed, that we would be different when we leave here this morning. Help us, Lord, to draw near to you to hold fast to our confession and then to stir each other up with those glorious truths. So lead us this morning. May you be exalted. We, we ask this in Jesus' mighty name and all God's people said, amen. Well, right out of the gate in our text this morning, as Grant read, we kind of have a summary of what we've learned thus far in the book of Hebrews. Let's look again at verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. So that's a gospel truth that's going to be an anchor for us this morning. We have confidence 
to enter the holy places. We've heard that time and again. We have confidence. We now have access to the throne room of God. If we stop and pray right now, you can go into the throne room of God. You don't have to go through sacrifices. You don't have to go to someone else to make sacrifices for you. You can go. So you have access. So that's gospel truth one there. We have confidence to enter the holy places. But we also have a great high priest. Look at verse 21. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, we have an advocate with the Father. So we're not going to go into detail of these two things because we have spent n- numerous messages, numerous Sunday mornings studying these truths, but we have an advocate with the Father. When we pray, he advocates for us. He prays on our behalf. So we have access and we have an advocate. And those truths we want to keep in front of us as we look at application. Because we don't want the application to be like, well, yeah, now we have a new list of things that we need to do. No, we do them because we have access and because we have an advocate. And that should make an effect. And the overflow of knowing those truths should make a difference in how we live. So here's action point number one from the text. Draw near. So look at verse 22. Let us draw near. Don't be hindered from coming into God's presence. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid because your heavenly father isn't maybe like your earthly father or like some authority maybe that you've had in your life at some point in time. Don't be afraid. Draw near. So you don't don't have to be hesitant. You can come. But also there's the command here to draw near to those who are tempted to run away or run the other way. Maybe things of this world are are tempting and, and drawing you the other way. So the author of Hebrews is saying, no, draw near. Come to this place. This is where you need to draw near. Don't be distracted by these other things because you were created to worship God. Exodus 23 says, you shall have no other gods before me. Don't go the other way. Draw near here to God. So when we talk about worship, we aren't just talking about when we gather corporately to sing songs. Worship is our whole manner of life. We are called to present our bodies holy and acceptable, like living, that's our worship. So we live our lives before God and our response to do that is a response to the mercy of God. But there's something that happens when we draw near and Martin Lloyd-Jones explains it well. He says, It is only when I am near to God in Christ that I know my sins are forgiven. I feel his love. I know I am his child. And I enjoy the priceless blessings of peace with God and peace with within and peace with others. I am aware of his love and I am given a joy that the world can neither give nor take away. So let us draw near. Our drawing near, brothers and sisters, isn't to check off a box. We don't encourage you to read your Bible every day or spend time with God every day so that you can check off your Christian box and then move on. No, we, we know that when you draw near, you change. We know that when you draw near to Christ, you change. He changes you. You experience what Martin Lloyd-Jones mentioned. You experience joy. You experience peace. You get wisdom. You get clarity. You get assurance that the things that are going on right now aren't the things that are going to define you for eternity. You're reminded where you will be for eternity. That's what happens when you draw near. So we don't want to rush past that because God does something when we draw near. But how do we draw near? Well, the passage helps us to see how we can draw near. How can we benefit from drawing near? 
He says, let us draw near, look at verse 22, with a true heart. What does that mean, a true heart? That means being focused, being wholehearted, like giving everything in that moment, being genuine, being honest. Don't we long for that sometimes? Like in our relationships, we just, we don't, we don't care all the gifts that people have or the resources they have. We just, we just want to be real. We just want people to be real with us. Well, the place that you can be real, the most real, the most open, the most humble is in the presence of God because of what Jesus has done. So draw near and just be real. When you get before God in his presence, you don't have to be someone else. There's not someone looking over your shoulder going, well, is he praying the right words? I mean, did she just pray something that wasn't theologically accurate? No, you just, when you get before the Lord, you draw near with a pure heart, with a true heart, and just be real. Be completely open and honest. All you have to do is read a few Psalms. These guys were pretty honest. You know, Lord, this stinks. Lord, smite those people. I am so sick of them. Draw near with a true heart. You don't need to be, don't, don't have mixed motives. When you come, just be real. Be completely absorbed in him. I appreciate how Wes has led us this morning. He wants us to be completely absorbed in Christ. Let's just pause and soak in Christ. So we come because of access, because of the advocate with sincerity. We come with full assurance. It says, with a true heart in full assurance of faith. I mean, just unwavering knowing God's promises. Unwavering trust in God and unwavering trust in his promises. Come with full assurance. Why is the author saying that? Because oftentimes we don't come with full assurance. We kind of come with weak knees and we're kind of struggling a little bit. And maybe when you you go to pray. You just, I think I'm, I'm too exhausted to pray. Maybe it's not physical. Maybe it's emotional exhaustion. I don't feel like I've got this in me. And he's like, no, no, no. Sister, brother, you, you don't have to have it all together. You can come with full assurance. You can come trusting in who God is. You can come trusting in his promises because they will happen without fail. He is faithful. He is mighty. He is holy. You can learn about some of those in, in the Psalms too. As we were praying before church this morning, we were praying in Psalm 100. There were just some truths about God that were just, boom, rock solid right there. So come with full assurance. Not because you've had to work something up, but because it is sure. And you can come with full assurance because of what Christ has done. So you come with sincerity, come with full assurance, and look again at the text with a true heart and full assurance of faith. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Come knowing you're freed and come knowing you're filled. Come knowing you're freed, come knowing you're filled. You're freed because you have a cleansed heart, that your, your heart was sprinkled clean because Jesus removed your guilt when he went to the cross. And if you're someone who's here this morning and you just feel guilt like you've never, you've never trusted in Christ and you feel that guilt, you're like, I don't know if I like to go to church sometimes because I just kind of feel bad about well, that, that's God working in you, and the answer to that is for you to, for you to trust in Jesus Christ, to repent of your sins and trust in Christ because you can be free from that guilt, from anything that you've done wrong, any weight that was there. He has, he has gone to the cross to pay the penalty for every sin for those who would trust in him. So we are freed. Christ cleanses us from a guilty conscience as we learned when we studied Hebrews chapter 9. 
And it says bodies washed, our bodies washed with pure water. Certainly there's kind of a picture there of baptism. When we, when we get baptized, like some are gonna get baptized at the church picnic, we do make a declaration, but baptism is a declaration. It's an outward sign of an inward working that's happened an inward working of God changing us and saving us and sending his spirit to live in us. In Ezekiel 36, it was prophesied, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols, I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. God has put his spirit in us. So he's freed us and he's filled us. So even as we come, some of the aspects of us coming are the things that he's done, not the things that we do. So come to God with undivided affection. Come to him with confidence. Come with a spirit of repentance. It's right for us to come and know that he is a holy God, and we are not. But we don't stay in that place because we know he has sprinkled us clean. He has washed us clean. And when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you should come before him if you're feeling that weight. And come relying on God's Holy Spirit to work in you. Because he is working in you. He's the one that acted upon you to draw you to himself. He's the one that transformed your life. And he's the one that's conforming you to the image of his son. You aren't on like a hamster wheel just, just trying to generate something and make something happen. No, he is at work in you. And you can rest in that as you come to him. So let's draw near right now. I know we don't typically pause in the middle of a message to take some time to pray, but we're gonna we're gonna pause right now. And I'm gonna read again what Martin Lloyd Jones said, why we're gonna pause. Because it says, he says, It is only when I am near to God in Christ that I know my sins are forgiven. I feel his love. I know I am his child, and I enjoy the priceless blessings of peace that with God and peace within and peace with others, and I'm aware of his love, and I'm, I am given a joy that the world can neither give nor take away. So I'm, I'm going to ask the folks in the, the back to play some music, and I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. No one's going to get up out of their seats. I'm not calling anyone forward. We're not going to embarrass anyone. But the call of the passage is to draw near. Why would we want to talk about that and just say, well, maybe, why don't you do that tomorrow morning? No, we're gonna draw near right now before we move on in the passage. So right where you are, don't don't look around at other people. I'm actually gonna tell you what's gonna be up on the slides to help prompt us to pray. You're not gonna pray to impress the person next to you. Because here's the deal, the, the thing you're going to pray, that they can't do anything about. But the one we are going to, the one we are drawing near to, he can. He's the ruler over the whole universe. So as we start praying, you can pray you know, quietly out loud, or you can just pray to yourself. Let's just have our heads bowed so we're not distracted by others. You can close your eyes, you can keep your eyes open. It's not about if your eyes are open or closed. But start with this. When I, Father, when I have confidence to enter your presence, I. So don't, don't start with making a request. Let's go to God. Let's acknowledge him because he is worthy. So, so Father, when I have confidence to enter your presence, I have peace. Maybe that's what you're going to pray. But now you pray. You pray something and pray a number of things. Father, when I have confidence to enter your presence, I. So let's just pray for a few minutes.
Lord, when I have confidence to enter your presence. Just come to him. Be real before him. Father, when I have confidence to enter your presence, I experience the peace that surpasses all understanding to guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. When I have confidence to enter your presence, you give wisdom generously and without reproach. When I have confidence to enter your presence, I'm more aware of how great you are and how small I am. Now let's ask, because he is worthy and we are needy. He is worthy and we are needy. So, Father, I confidently trust you too, and let's just ask him. So just go before the Lord right now. Father, I confidently trust you too, and just ask him for anything. Ask him for things that only he can do. Ask him to meet that heart need in your life right now. to know you. Father, I pray for us that this wouldn't be the last time that we meet with you, that we would draw near because we have access and because we have an advocate. May we not forget that is why we draw near, because we can. And when we don't, he still prays. When we don't pray rightly, he prays rightly. We thank you, God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So for some of you, you're like, that was really weird. I've never done that before. Everybody was in the room. Some of you were like, why did we stop? It's kind of annoying that we stopped. I was really having a moment with Jesus. It's okay. We're going to serve those that are just getting started. You can spend some more time with Jesus this afternoon. But before we transition back into the text, let's, let's corporately do something. How, how is Christ your hope today? What's one word or phrase that you would use to describe God? Now, right now I'm going to ask you to share out loud that word. Maybe, maybe you've experienced some healing in your life, and so you're going to say, God, you are my healer. Some of you are like, you, you want me to talk out loud, like for everyone to hear? Yes. Now, we're not going around the room. We're not going to start with this person and then go to this person, so don't freak out. But also don't be hindered because you're worried about like, well, what if I say something that's wrong? Okay? No judgment zone. Everybody agree? No judgment zone. Okay, someone throws out bad theology, hey, they're pure in heart before the Lord. Don't judge them, okay? So let's just say some, some truth about God. What's one, one word phrase that, that you can say that would describe God? And, and, and say it, God, you are mine. So let's just have a few people say that. We're not looking around the room to go, oh, I know, I know that person. We're not doing this for other people. Uh, we're talking to God. 
So who's going to go first? God, you are. Oh, sorry to interrupt you. Say it loud. Keep going. It's okay if two people do it once. God can hear. Savior, excellent. Fantastic. Thanks for taking a step of faith and sharing that because when we share those things out loud, we, we are doing what we see in the next verse, okay? Look at the next verse. It says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promises faithful. Let's hold fast our confession. We're, we're confessing truth about God. We're holding on to God. It's not confession, this is about a particular creed that we're holding on to that we subscribe to or that we put on a t-shirt or a bumper sticker. That's not what it means. We're holding on to truth. We're committed to truth in our life. We're committed so that we don't separate our understanding of truth and how we live our life. The worst thing that I could do to serve you as a pastor is to teach you all about the Bible and not have it change your life. We don't want to become a bunch of Bible fatheads. We want to delight in the truth because we're going to need to know that truth because the storms of life are going to come. And in this world, people are holding on to stuff that's going to be as solid as the sand on the beach. One professor his name is William Marston of New York University. Some time ago, he asked 3,000 people, what have you to live for? And he was shocked to discover that 94% were simply enduring the present while they waited for the future. What, what do you live for? 94% were just enduring, just getting through waited for something to happen, waiting for next year, waiting for a better time, waiting for someone to die, waiting for tomorrow, waiting for the report, waiting for, they're just, they're just waiting. Because they think if, we get, if I get over that hill, if I get over that hill, then it's gonna be fine. But we all know in life, we, we get over the hill and there's another hill and there seems another hill. And sometimes it comes in the form of just waves coming. Like, wait a second, I think, will the wave just stop? I, I'm taking on water here. And too many people are trying to survive on too little. They're depending on ungrounded, ungrounded unproven hope that will only disappoint rather than deliver for them. So we want to hold fast. So why would we say those truths about God out loud? Well, one, we're reminding ourselves, and we articulate it out loud, we're bringing praise to God. Number two, when we say it out loud, there's someone else in the room that needed to hear that truth about God, and you're helping them hold on. Maybe they couldn't bring themselves to say something, but when you said what you said, that hit home for them. So we need to hold fast our confession without wavering. It says in the text, hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Why does he say without wavering? Because we're going to need to be uncompromising in the face of adversity. And we're going to learn more about these Christians that who this was written to next week here, let me give you a taste. Hebrews 10, 34, the second half of that verse says this. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Okay, we're not gonna take all the time to unpack, but I'm still, every single time I read that passage, I stop because it, it doesn't compute with my experience. I understand joy and I understand plundering of property. 
I've never seen a movie where the two of those go together. There's always the plunderers that, that crush and discourage and there's downcast or there's people that are joyful. But here, they joyfully accept the plundering of their property. How did they do that? Because they had a better possession and an abiding one. Because they held fast to their confession without wavering. Friends, as Christians, it's no secret that we are becoming unpopular in our culture. Not just in our culture, in our country, in the world. And unless, I'm not here to be a doomsdayer, but here's the reality. Unless God moves in a powerful way and brings revival to our nation, the direction that is, things are going is persecution for us. And when that comes, what will we hold on to? What will you hold on to? Because I can tell you this, if you're holding on to the election of a different senior official at whatever level, state, local, national government, if you're holding on to that, you're holding on to nothing. You're holding on to a human being who is fallible. Because the direction that this is going doesn't change unless God moves. If you're holding on to a Supreme Court decision and you think that's going to do it, I can tell you people have held on to the expectation that political powers will change things throughout all of the history of the world. People have, have put their hope in systems and structures in human beings and they have been discouraged. What will get us through? I might not be talking about today. Because the reality is, is we, we really aren't afraid that someone's going to bust through that door right now. No one has locked this building or burnt it to the ground yet. But if that happens, what will we, what will get us through? This is what will get us through. Look back at your Bibles. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. For he who promised is faithful. He's faithful. He's the one that's defined faithfulness. We can count on him again and again and again and again. He always delivers. You know someone in your life that you know they're faithful. You know that when they give their word, they do what they say they're going to do. Well, as we read about his word and what he said he will do, we can know he's going to do it. Every single thing, every jot and tittle of what you read in your Bible, he is faithful and he will do it. One commentator said, no ancient or modern sailor who knows what can happen during an ocean voyage would go to sea in a ship that carried no anchor. Even today, and even if the ship were the greatest and most modern vessel afloat, every sailor knows that situations might arise when the hope of the ship and all her company will depend not on the captain, not on the crew, not on the engines, not on the compass, not on the rudder, but on the anchor. When all else fails, there is hope in the anchor. It was so easy for Christians to appropriate this as their symbol because its very shape uses the form of the cross. And as we learned early in the book of Hebrews, our anchor is not out in the sea somewhere where the rays are going. It's not out in the middle of the lake. Our anchor is in heaven. We learn in Hebrews 6, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest, high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The truth is, brothers and sisters, like our life is going to experience 
trial. I don't know if you've ever thrown a cork or something that floats out into the water when the water is really rough or when the sea is really rough. It just kind of bobs up and down, up and down like a cork. How are we going to hold fast when our life feels just like that? And some of you might feel that right now. Our hope is anchored in the truth about who Christ is, not in us holding on in the fact that we have access and we have an advocate. Because when you feel like you're not holding on, he's holding on to you. So that tenacity of holding on, of reaching out, that will endure any storm. Because ultimately it's not based on you. You just need to turn your gaze there. So what are you focusing your mind on? So we're going to, right now, we're going to stay seated. We're going to recite a creed together that we have been reciting maybe every few Sundays or so as we've gone through Hebrews. Again, this creed is not the end all. But the reason that we have been reciting it together is it reminds us of so many promises in God's word that it reminds us of our confession and our hope. So let's recite it together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So when we read that together, when we recite that, that's not just some religiosity that we're doing to check off a box. Yeah, we've been holy. No, we we recite that because we're needy, and we need to hear those truths again. I remember reciting those as a kid, and it was just, Blah, 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 blah. Boy, I can't wait till lunch comes. But when my life was transformed by the power of the gospel, it's like, wow, I recited that every Sunday and I missed the power that was there. I missed the power that was there. But even doing that, what we did, just reciting one word truths about God that does the same thing. When we gather in our small groups and you open the Bible and go, hey, this is where I've been reading in the scriptures this week, that's the same thing. We're reminding each other of the confession of our hope. When you take time to be alone with Jesus and you open your Bible, what are you doing? You're holding fast to your confession. So let's draw near. Let's let's hold fast. And then let's stir up one another. Action point number three is stir up one another. Look at verses 24 and 25. Before we read those, uh, I know the music's playing in the background and that can be helpful, but I'm going to ask them to shut off the music because there's not really like a subtle tone to what, what the author is saying here in this point, as he goes to stir up. Look at your Bibles. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. It's almost like he's been subtle for a little bit and then all of a sudden, you know, he's talking about stirring up. Stirring up isn't like, I'm going to stir the cream in my coffee because it's so nice and I'm going to get to drink it. It's not, oh, 
when I, when I go to the ice cream shop and they put wonderful things in the cup of ice cream and flavors, they stir it up for me. No, this is incite, provoke, stimulate. This is spurring one another on. This is active action. That's what he's calling the saints to do. Look, because you have access, because you have an advocate, consider something. Consider. Let us consider. That's what the text says. Let us consider. Let us be thoughtful about others. Not let us consider if we should meet together. Well, should we meet or not? I don't know. Now let's consider how we should meet together. In what manner should we meet together? How are you going to engage with your brothers and sisters in Christ when you are with them, whether it's on a Sunday morning, whether it's in your small group, whether it's in some other context? Am I going to be a means of grace in their life? Or by considering them, we, we are trained to think about ourselves. I, that shouldn't be a shock to anyone. I'm sure if, if people answered a poll and were honest, hey, has selfishness gotten worse over the last 10 years? You'd be lying if you said no. Like, we're just a selfish people. All you have to do is talk to some other people from other countries. That's what they think about us. Even as a nation, we're selfish. That's why I call it selfish media, because people go out there to talk all about who? Themselves. Look at me. Look at not that you can't post a picture of your family so that the rest of your family that doesn't live here can't know. I'm not trying to condemn anyone. But we are selfish. But our thoughts are better utilized when we consider. Consider to focus on others. Are they discouraged? Is she doubting? Is he tempted? Are, are they struggling? Are you going thinking about them? What's the condition of those around you and how can you serve them? If we're not thinking about others, we're nothing more than consumers. Oh, should I go? I don't know. You know, I kind of like that we have a live stream because I can wear my pajamas on Sunday morning and I can eat ice cream for breakfast because everybody else left for church and I'm home by myself and I can watch and just completely be by myself. Now, I'm so grateful we have the live stream. I am. I remember the days when I think my wife missed, you know, 50 out of 52 Sundays in a year because it seemed like every week somebody was sick. So I love it that we can serve folks that have to be at home for different Reason. So I'm not knocking that or not anyone who would want to use it. I think it's great because actually we use the live stream to serve folks that are nursing moms in the nursing mother's room. So that's really great. So don't hear me say what I'm not saying. But are we engaging because we're thinking about others? We are our brother's keeper. Brothers and sisters, look around you right now. I know earlier I said don't look around. Right now, I'm telling you to look around. Now, don't, don't, don't stare in someone and make them feel uncomfortable and make a stupid face at them, you know? Uh, unless you're by Wes. You can make a funny face at Wes. No. So look around. Just look around at the people. Just kind of glance around. You don't have to look at some people in the eye because you want to be uncomfortable. Just look around. The people that you're looking at are those for whom Christ died. They're those for whom Christ Christ died. So we must take care of them. We must help them. Let us consider them. So as we consider them, let's stir them up. Let's spur others on. We provoke them. We, we share things with them. Certainly, by, we'll do that by our words. Hebrews 3.13 says, But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So sometimes that's going to come in terms of our words. We're going to encourage one another every day. Not just like once in a while, not just once a week, like every day, as long as it is called today. Well, there's still some time left. Why don't I think about others? So we're going to do it with our words, but that's not the only way we do it. We do it with our actions. Does your life stimulate 
others to worship Christ or live for Christ? Like, is your life stirring them up? I know it's easy, particularly as parents. We, we think we can stir our kids up to do, you know, because we have wise words of wisdom that they should listen to, right? Right? Or if you've ever taught a Harvest Kids class, well, of course, when I say things, they just do what I say, right? I'm going to stimulate. Yeah, so we do need to share words of truth, but our actions should stimulate I won't go into the details, but just yesterday, my, my son did this for me. There was something that we, we encountered, and in my, in my mind, I wanted to respond with impatience and say some things that were not kind. But the actions that he, he did right before that moment stopped me in my tracks. There's a, a, a lady in our church that has, has experienced cancer, and if you got to know her, you know, she's, she's currently experiencing, she's free from that weight right now. But if you got to interact with her, she's like joyous all the time. She regularly has, she's had numerous surgeries. She's experienced pain and, and trauma and trial. And, and when I'm around her, there's just joy, just overflowing joy that's coming out of her. And you know what it does for me? It, it helps me not to whine. Not because I compare and go, well, her situation is harder than mine, so I shouldn't whine. It's not about comparing. It's going, I want to be like that. How can I be like her? Because she's obviously holding on to something. What is she holding on to? She knows that her hope is secure in something else. In Jesus' blood and righteousness. She knows her anchor is in heaven with Jesus. And it flows out of her life. So she provokes me more by what she does and who she is than by what she says. And if you've been in a small group with her, what she says also provokes you too. So let's stir up one another. Stir up one another. You know, we're gonna get, get each other going. And how are we going to do that? By not neglecting to meet together. Look at verse 25. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We need each other. This whole thing is not Jesus and me. We need community. We were created to be in community. Because we forget we have access and an advocate. We forget we have access and an advocate. And we need to be reminded of that. So we connect even in our discipleship process, we talk about abiding, connecting, and sharing. Why do we talk about connecting? Certainly, we talk about drawing near, abiding. Why do we talk about connecting? Because that's what we were designed to do. Paul didn't write letters to individuals. He wrote them to churches, to groups. So we gather on Sunday mornings, and there's thousands of reasons to stay away from Sunday morning church. The problem isn't new. The early church had the problem. They had a drop off in attendance, believe it or not, because of persecution and shunning and people rejecting the faith. And we might not be facing that as of yet, but we are prone to laziness and excuses. But Kent Hughes said this. He said, we meet Christ in a special way in corporate worship. It is true that a person does not have to go to church to be a Christian. He does not have to go home to be married either. But in both cases, if he does not, he will have a very poor relationship. Congregational worship makes it possible for us to praise God in a different way than when we're by ourselves. And you should praise God by yourself. You should totally be at home having a dance party in your bedroom. Talk to two different people this week that, that they have that experience. You're not going to know who they are because that's for the, between them and the Lord. But they're free. They get the whole drawing near thing. But when we gather together, there's something that happens with the volume. There's something that happens with the corporate nature of things that just magnifies the Lord in a way that's different when we're home. So if you want to stay home and not gather with the church gathered, you're just kind of taking a bit more glory away from the Lord. When we gather, we, we, we give our full praise to God. Martin Luther said, at home, in my house, there's no warmth or vigor in me. 
But in the church, when the multitude is gathered together, a fire is kindled in my heart and it breaks its way through. Sometimes we need to be with the church gathered to help us to take the next step. But we also gather in small groups. Why do we gather in small groups? Because it's impossible to be a faithful Christian when we're absent from the assembled church. Again, there are times and seasons and and reasons to miss your small group. I'm not trying to pour out condemnation on anyone. But we have a responsibility for each other. And unfortunately, I have seen time and again individuals who pull themselves back from the fellowship of the saints and that inevitably in not very long a time means heartache and trial and hurt and struggle. And maybe on the outside their life looks amazing because they're making a lot of money or they look successful before the world. But their life's in shambles because they didn't prioritize the fellowship with the saints. I'm tempted to skip small groups sometimes. But what are you asking before you go? Like, there's times you need to. Like, it's been hard. You got two hours of sleep the night before. But I think I've asked the question, oh, you know, are they going to serve me? Maybe going to small group actually isn't about you. Maybe you need to go to small group to share that truth about God that you've learned because someone else needs to hear it. Or maybe the person who's not there, you need to go find that person after the meeting and give them a call because they need to hear the truth about God. We need to be thinking about others. We need to be stirring one another up. We need to encourage one another. This phrase means to come alongside with words and actions. Maybe it's helping them to bear a load. Maybe it's sharing the truth that they need to hear. Maybe it's just just being with them. Encouragement looks different in, in different ways with different people. But as one commentator said, like climbers rope together on a steep mountain, like soldiers team together on a battlefield, we must keep track of one another. We must work together if we are to reach our objective safely. Because the day is drawing near. All the more as you see the day drawing near. We're all threatened by sin and temptation. We all need to draw near, hold fast, and stir up. And the word says to us in Hebrews 3.13, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Exhort one another as long as it is called today, so that you may not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. It doesn't say, well, once I get comfortable with people, well, then I can kind of slip off. No, there's an urgency. There's not a time to coast. Jesus is coming back. And all you have to do is open up the newspaper to know things are getting worse. And that means he's getting back. As you see birth pangs coming, that means he is coming back. So let's stir one another up to love and good works. Let it do it by our example. Let's do it by the truth of God's word. Let's walk together. Let's, let's care for one another. Sometimes let's correct one another. Let's forgive one another. All those one another's that we do. And we're going to do that right now. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exhort you to take some action before we leave here today. So in this moment, I'm not going to have you leave the building. We're, we're not locking the back doors. Like if you got to leave. No one's going to throw themselves in front of the door. But, but the meeting is not over. And Harvest Kids, is, they're still in action down there. They're, they're, they're going to be okay. What I want you to do is I want you to open your Bibles. Whether you got it on your phone or whether you have a paper copy, open up your Bibles to some place the Lord has met you this week. Where has the Lord met you someplace this week? If you're like, 
oh man, I've not been in my Bible this week. Well, just open up to Hebrews. You're not lying. You've been in this text since we started, what, like half an hour ago. So use this text if you need to. Because I think there's some encouraging things here. And what I want you to do is I want you to go to at least one other person in the room and, and I want you to encourage them. So for some of you, that means getting up out of your seat. Um, but again, if you're, if, you're, if you're here with some people, you can just kind of turn to them and you can share something with them. If you're like, you know, I see that person across the room, I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna go share this with them because I really want to encourage them. We're gonna encourage each other right now. This is not wooden. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not forcing you to come share something with me. You don't have to make something up. God met you this week. So I want you to, I want you to go. I'm gonna have them put some, some of the music back on again just because there's a little in the, in the back of the room just in case like, you know, you trip and fall and make a bunch of noise. That'll be in the back, it's okay. But let's go encourage each other and then make your way back to your seat. And if you're here by yourself, don't, don't be intimidated by that. You can, you can come up here and, and encourage me or you can stay totally in your seat. We are not here. We do not wanna embarrass anyone this morning. We wanna be an encouragement. So even if you see someone by themselves, maybe go over there. Share that you can share with more than one person, okay? So let's take a few minutes right now and encourage each other. Stir one another up. Okay, go. Again, we're not done with the meeting. Go encourage someone. Go encourage multiple someones. to stop you right now, but, but I'm going to stop you for just a moment. But we can continue all afternoon, okay? The AC's working. We'll leave the lights on. We're, we're going to do that. And so if you didn't get to talk to everyone you wanted to talk to, do that before you go. But who, who's encouraged in this moment? That's what we're called to do. You've been obedient to God's word. We're called to draw near. We're called to hold fast. We're called to stir up. But we do that because we have access and we have an advocate. 
And the plan was to just kind of end things right here, but I want to throw the worship team for a loop. Are, are, is the worship team all still here? Are all three of you still here? Could you come back up? Maybe they are. Maybe they're, maybe they're not. We'll find out. Um, we're we're going we're gonna to sing uh, Behold the Lamb. Because though, though it's great to end with the application of stirring up one another, the reason we're stirring up one another is because we have access and we have an advocate. And may what we do never become the thing that's more important than what he has done. So as they frantically get themselves ready to serve you, I wasn't serving them, but I know them. They love you. They're selfless. So I knew they would want to come up and serve you because these guys love singing about Jesus. If you've ever come on a first Thursday night, they just sing to Jesus when you're not here. They don't need you to be here because they're not singing to you. They're singing to him, the audience of one. So why don't we stand and behold the Lamb together?